Welcome to Living Well with MS, the podcast from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, celebrating its 10th year of serving the MS community. I'm your host, Jeff Alex. The goal of our organisation and this podcast is to inform, support and empower people with MS to lead full and happy lives. We're excited you could join us for this new episode. Make sure to check out this episode's show notes for more information and useful links. You can find these on our website at overcomingms.org slash podcast or on whichever podcast platform you use to tune into our program. If you enjoy the show, please spread the word about us on your social media channels or leave a review wherever you tune into our podcast. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org or you can reach out to me directly on Twitter at Jeff Alex. We'd love to hear from you. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favourite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And now, let's meet our guest for this episode. Welcome to the latest edition of the Living Well with MS podcast. This edition is on demystifying gluten with Dr. Colin Bannon. Dr. Bannon is a retired medical doctor, or GP, who was diagnosed with MS at the age of 58. He was born in London and after early years working in farming and factories, studied medicine in Sheffield, qualifying in 1985. He was a GP in Devon, England for over 20 years. Colin realised that smoking, the Western diet and stress were the main reasons for the development of the chronic diseases filling appointment lists and hospital wards. As a result, he developed an interest in preventative medicine, focusing on the impact that a diet high in sugar and fat has on the health of his patients. Since his own diagnosis, he has followed the OMS recovery program and remains in good health, relapse-free and with scans unchanged since diagnosis. He leads a local OMS discussion group and is working with the local MS team to help promote the benefits of a healthy lifestyle to people recently diagnosed with MS. Colin was also one of the presenters at the Amex 2017 Seven Steps to Overcoming MS event. Colin's hobbies are politics, growing food, writing and contemplating the future while having fun with his grandson. So welcome to the programme, Colin, and thanks so much for joining us on Living Well with MS. Hello, good to be here. And um, before we um, dig into the topic and we talk about gluten and MS, um, could you share uh, with us a bit about your personal professional backgrounds, um, your medical experience, and also your history with MS and OMS? Yeah, well, I uh, left school rather early and started working on farms, which gave me an early interest in food in my life and its production. Classic, uh, classically, if you want to become a doctor, I think that's always the advice, isn't it? Leave school early. <laughs> yeah, it was in my case. Uh, but I went into medicine at the age of 25 and um, worked in the NHS for 25 years, a GP for 20 years, um, and then developed um, MS, or was diagnosed, I should say, with MS at the age of 55, um, but of course, like so many of us, once you get the diagnosis, you realise, you know, it's not as if you develop the illness there. I think I developed the illness when I was 18 after infectious um, mononucleosis glandular fever and had various little symptoms through my life till it finally got to the point where with all the modern technology of scanning and so on and so forth, I was able to get to the point where I realised I had MS, which came to me as a bit of a shock, as it does for us all, because up to then I'd been relatively healthy, but it did for me, explain a lot of very strange phenomena in my life, which um, which so which was good in a way. It was a relief to have the diagnosis because a lot of things became very clear. I'm also a food grower um, with a bit of a farming background. I've got enough space where I live to grow my own food, and I've been become acutely aware of how good food is good for us. Um, fresh food is just unbelievably good and um, I think the combination of being a GP appreciating the health promoting benefits of food and having MS myself so it all we all somebody like us all who need to tighten up on our diet and make sure we do our best um, puts me in a position where I find myself knowing quite a lot about this topic and um and actually, you're, and you're very um, good at sharing as well, because we're in the same RMS circle. So you actually, you share a lot of information on there, which is um, all sorts of things like COVID things. And, and uh, yeah, you, you're very happy to share what you know, aren't you? 
Well, I always thought I'd like to write a blog, but never quite got round to it because when the pandemic came along and lockdown, I thought, well, you know, we've got we've all we've all got more time. So I started writing the blog about COVID and very much along the same lines, really, because, you know, the healthier you are, the better chance you have of, you know, doing well with COVID, which it seems like we're all, we were all, we were all going to come across at one point or another, or most of us anyway. Um, and many of the same messages that apply to people with MS do apply to the population at large to, uh, you know, to, to look after your health. So I started writing a blog and doing a bit of, a bit of research every day to back it up. So that became another little facet to my, <laughs> to my um, obsession with food and health and the relationship between lifestyle and how we feel and how we enjoy life. So um, we're going to be talking about gluten. And just so before we get into specific questions... Um, just on a general point, what is gluten? We can think of um, gluten as the scaffolding which holds um, uh, grains together in a way. I mean, the, the, the Latin for gluten, the word, the, the place where it comes from is for glue. And it's literally the, 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 the protein structure that holds, holds wheat together. And for humanity, it's had a huge impact because it gives bread uh, and then and gives flour and thus bread or it gives dough, I should say, more specifically, this sort of elastic, gluey property. Also, you can make bread out of it, which can be preserved um, to a degree. And uh, we've, we've been doing that for 30,000 years now, and it's had a big impact on human development because it's been one of those staple foods which can be relatively easily grown. Critically important, it can be stored so populations could get through the winter. Um, and it can be processed into bread relatively simply in, you know, what was historically most people's own kitchens. So it's had a huge impact on humanity uh, for better, mainly because it's a highly nutritious food. But there are, you know, as we'll come to shortly, some issues with it, which we all need to be aware of. It's the scaffolding in a way that holds the whole thing up. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, it. The portability is is one of those sort of things you mentioned. I was just thinking where we live, the pasty is a is a sort of go to staple, and and I um, I sort of make my own pasties, uh, which are sort of OMS friendly pasties that I always found quite help, handy if I go travel. Because I used before the pandemic, I travelled a lot, and I'd always go with several pasties because they were like a big solid full meal. And so I, I could then sort out where I could eat when I got to a place in yeah. the world. And but I had my sort of couple of pasties. Um, so, but that so is to... yeah. How do you do that with it? That, but anyway, that's a sort of more a, a question of someone like Jack McNulty. How do you make something uh, transferable if you're not got gluten? <laughs> um, well, we'll come to that. So, um, is but straight to the sort of heart of it then. Is gluten bad for people with MS? Uh, no, I think it's general, generally speaking, it's not. That's the first thing to say. But people with MS are human beings like anybody else. And about two in a thousand people with MS will have a proper wheat allergy and come up with rashes and all sorts of symptoms when they're exposed to wheat. So like someone who's celiac or something like that? Yeah, well, celiac's, and, celiac's the next thing. 1% of the population now have celiac disease. Right. And it looks like about 1% of the population with MS will also have celiac disease, which in the UK would be about, about 13, 1,300 people. Um, some of those would have been undiagnosed. I mean, most people with celiac have it diagnosed, severe celiac have it diagnosed in childhood, where it causes really significant symptoms. But for a lot of people, it grumbles on and it's not quite bad enough to you know, get you to the doctor, but it's, it interferes with life. But when you get diagnosed with MS and you try and improve your health, then um, uh, you know, unwanted gut symptoms start to be more, become more important. So for anybody with MS who thinks they may have gluten uh, problems, it's important to see your doctor. Again, there's blood tests, there's various things that can be done to, ty to diagnose that. As I say, there's 1,300 people out there who have formal diagnosis of MS and celiac disease, and it's important to get on top of both of them. Um, underneath that, there's about one in 10 people in the country who report symptoms of intolerance to gluten, as you mentioned a moment ago, who have trouble with, with wheat and all its products. 
and there's irritable bowel syndrome with, with which with which it shares an overlap and there's something called non non specific gluten sensitivity also gray areas fairly poorly defined conditions but um the common feature of which is people who eat bread bread products maybe a, maybe above a certain dose and then have symptoms of bloating too much wind abdominal pain and not feeling very well and again and for the for the one in 10 people who experience those things it's very important to take certain measures to define your relationship with gluten i guess the first thing to do in those situations unless you feel sufficiently unwell to need a doctor in which case that's the thing to do but if it's just one of those background grumbling issues it's fair enough to to, to try a gluten free diet which involves um giving up grains cereals basically which can sometimes be a good thing in itself because the average western diet of course includes breakfast cereals which to me are long acting or often long acting metabolic poisons they're largely you know low quality grains lots of sugar lots of processed chemicals and they're pretty bad for you anyway um but if you give up gluten you give up a lot a lot of good food but you also give up a lot of bad food um so i guess just taking a step back the first thing to do if you're worried about gluten sensitivity is to get bad processed food out of your diet uh, and just to, if you're going to buy bread buy really good stuff and see if that makes a difference um and if that doesn't make a difference giving gluten up altogether is a bit more of a challenge but it needs doing um and then waiting for 6 weeks to see how you are now if after 6 weeks you feel a lot better and you think right i'm sensitive to gluten i would suggest the thing to do then is to reintroduce it into your diet <laughs> have all the not the processed stuff but high quality grains uh in high quality bread to just to see if your symptoms come back because if your symptoms don't come back you could think well it's probably not the gluten it may be something else you could have a placebo effect from taking positive action in your life um you may have given up the low quality stuff which which is very bad for your stomach so the the good let's say the good cause so i've um periodically sort of made my own sourdough and stuff because of lockdown whatever and time on my hands um and and also there was no bread was there in the supermarkets so is it to the extent of make your own sourdough or if you go to if you're in the supermarket and rather than buying the stuff that's in plastic bag you go to the back and buy the stuff that, that, that they've sort of baked well I, i think they sort of part bake it don't they in store but the sort of stuff that's you know the fanciest stuff at the back of the store that's not in a plastic bag is that acceptable or are you saying you really need to be making your own sourdough type situation I think it's a halfway house the the, the quality of, in supermarkets there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in plastic which is highly processed It, and incredibly when you talk about supermarkets 60% of the calories we eat in this country now come from ultra processed foods and many of the breads are in that category and that they're a real issue for anybody with MS or any human being on the planet I think um I'm lucky here because I've got a bakery up the road which is a small enterprise run by a family they get they get their their, their grains from an organic farm in Somerset and including spelt wheat which they can make for me and has no effect on me at all and in fact has a positive effect because it's a very healthy food but that costs 3 pound 50 a loaf for mm. a 2 kilo loaf and a 2 kilo loaf of white standard off the shelf bread costs what 60p or something So there's an issue there for people who are struggling with finances but real locally made you know bread that, that you know the you know its provenance either you make it yourself from grains that you may know where they come from is the ideal anything less than that in a way is less than ideal but again it you got to take a step back and think well look is it bothering you we're all different you know if you if you got if you've been eating the same bread for years and you're really not having a problem well then you just need to worry you just carry on doing what you're doing yeah. it's when it's that it's that 10% of people who are having trouble with bloating tiredness uh, who are concerned about a connection between what they're doing and their ms symptoms who need to take a step back and think right let's make sure i haven't got a serious problem by seeing a doctor let's try and exclude gluten by going uh, you know or first as i said 
just try only finding a source of high quality bread and sticking with that to see if that makes a difference. And if you're still getting symptoms, give it up for six weeks, or two months, reintroduce it and see if your symptoms come back. And at that point, you'll pretty much know where you are. So, and um, how do you handle gluten in your own diet? Well, I, 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 I'm, I've never really had much of a problem with gluten. So I think in one of the, I'm one of the 90% who are just okay with it. But in terms of the OMS philosophy and my own philosophy to food, I like, as I said, I'm, happy, I'm lucky to have a baker up the road who can provide me with high quality product. I wouldn't, I don't think, buy bread on a regular basis from the vast majority of supermarkets because it's just not the quality I want and I can afford to pay three pound fifty for um, some, which I, which I think is about the price for high quality high quality product, um, and that's what I do. I, I also don't eat biscuits, buns, cakes, bagels, um, any of that processed food. As a little aside, uh, my my grandson's five; he's just started school. He came home one day with some bagels from school, or white bread bagels, which they didn't eat. It ended up uh, coming to me because I put all the waste food into my wormery. And I put these ba- these bagels were sitting in the middle of my wormery and the worms wouldn't eat them. Wow. <laughs> they actually upset the whole ecology of my wormery, which actually went to putrefaction. And it caused terrible trouble. And it, it turned into this horrible, gloopy white stuff that honestly, bacteria, fungi, moles, uh, mice and worms wouldn't touch with a barge pole. Now, if those organisms aren't going to eat this stuff, nor should we. <laughs> That's um, what made me realise about tea bags, actually, that tea bags are not um, biodegradable. Oh, they, I think they are now, actually, in the UK, but they weren't a few years back, Was that because that would go into the wormery, and the, all the tea bit would be gone, but the tea bag remained. And you're like, OK, yeah, no. that's not biodegradable, is it? <laughs> you think it was, you think what? it's just made out of paper, but it's not. It's, no, that's right. I think there's a per- pervasive thing going on where, as a population, we've got used to doing certain things like eating, drinking tea out of plastic tea bags. I mean, most of us didn't even know that was going on. Um, well, it looks like paper, doesn't it? So you assumed it well, was. exactly. <laughs> and then there's there's a the food thing where you get used to the food you're eating and you carry on eating it. Um, and you get used to feeling a certain way. And my experience as a, G- as a GP helping people improve their diet is how transformative actually to start eating good food really is. So if you move away from bagels and buns and cakes and biscuits and confection and um, wheaty confectionery and move to a healthy uh, wheat based um, bread or whatever other products you want to get really high quality, you can start feeling a lot better. And for a lot of my patients, and I've, I've seen it with people with MS, you start eating a healthy diet with good quality stuff in it, not the sort of stuff the worms won't touch. And you suddenly think, my God, I feel so much better. And I've had patients say to me, you know, for 20 years, I have felt rubbish compared to how I feel now on this diet. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to do. And it gives us a certain power over our own lives to, to improve how we feel. But I guess one of the traps with gluten is that I think it's about 3% of the population now who are on a gluten-free diet. The industry is worth 17 billion a year producing gluten-free foods, which are often not very high quality. And there are quite a few people out there who are not sensitive to gluten, who are eating a restrictive gluten-free diet, who would actually probably benefit from the nutrients available in well-produced, organically farmed wheat. And I think that's a big thing with food production generally that you can be vegan and really unhealthy because a lot of there's loads of vegan stuff in the supermarkets now but generally it's it's massively processed and equally i went down the free from all the other day because i've just started to try cutting down gluten and say like you're saying there's a load there's loads of gluten-free stuff but you look at the ingredient list and it's like half the packet long and you think that's you know for just Absolutely. something that's a uh, yeah, loaf of bread or something. That's massively processed. Well, the food industry are well advised by their food technologists and their, their advertising agencies, and they know how to get people to eat their stuff. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's another feature of our age, which is, I'm certain got something to do with the increasing prevalence of MS as well as other 
various diseases, that we are, some of us are eating the worst diet ever consumed by human beings. When you look at some of the products you, you experience in the free from aisle and you go to supermarkets and look around, you think, well, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and all the time that human beings walked this earth prior to that, we never ate the sort of food we're eating now. And when you look at those products, um, it, you know, we really shouldn't, like the worms, we shouldn't touch them with a barge pole. And I think one of the issues with gluten is before you, you, you go to the nuances of gluten and a gluten-free diet, it's, you know, you've got to remove the really bad stuff, the, you know, the highly processed sugary um, foods full of all sorts of preservatives and chemicals, um, which may be upsetting your microbiome, which, of course, is the focus, really, of where gluten has an impact on many people. Yeah. And so what interactions can gluten have uh, for people with MS? Well, I guess in a way, the same interactions it has with anybody else in that if it's low quality wheat in low quality food, which contains gluten, then it's going to make you feel worse. If you have a high sugar product, um, uh, you know, if you have two jam donuts with, just, with, with a coating of sugar, uh, made out of white bread, I actually think an hour later you're feeling worse. Your metabolism's been upset. Your blood sugar's gone up and peaked. Your insulin's come up to try and get it out of your blood, leaving you feel, you know, ideal for the, for the food industry, leaving you feel a couple of hours later hungry. So you'll have another donut. There's these traps that we all get into uh, with poor food. When it comes to gluten specifically, I'll go back to what I said earlier in that you want to, if you're having real problems with gluten, you may well have already been diagnosed with celiac. But if, it's, if, if you really get terrible bloating, uh, loose motions, feeling tired, um, uh, that after you've had a wheaty meal, then it's worth seeing your doctor. There's blood tests you can do to screen for celiac disease. And if, it's, if they're positive, it's worth going on to more sophisticated tests to make sure that's what you've got. Because if you've got celiac disease, then you need to avoid gluten totally for life. Um, but again, there's for a lot for a lot of people, it's just you know, you mentioned earlier on that if you you know have a sandwich, you know have a breakfast cereal in the morning and a sandwich for lunch and donuts halfway through the afternoon and a pizza for the evening, that is an incredible dose of wheat. Um, and you know you could take a step back and think, well, you know perhaps just have a sandwich for lunch and leave the rest. Just get the balance right mm -hmm. between what is a very nutritious food and and the volume of this stuff you can just get through. Um, and it can, it, in a way, if you're eating the wrong foods, the key for people with MS is it causes inflammation. And that's exactly what we want to avoid in MS. And that's probably mediated through the microbiome. So if um, someone is trying to cut down their gluten, how do you find, what's the best way of finding good gluten-free substitutes? Uh, well, looking at the label, for one thing, um, to find out uh, where what what its provenance is, where it's come from, and indeed, if if the if a food has a label, I'd already be suspicious because the you know the glue the the, the the bread I buy up from a trusted bakery up the road doesn't it comes in a paper bag, it doesn't have any labelling attached to it at all. So if you're already reading a label, you should be suspicious. Gluten free products, I'm not a big fan of, as you said earlier on, that this that they've got a list of ingredients as long as they're on. I don't think my experience of them is that they're, they're, they're as tasty and I don't think they're as nutritious as the real thing. So I, I would personally avoid gluten-free products. And if you genuinely want to get gluten out of your life, then I would get grains and cereals out of your life and concentrate on the whole range of other foods which will provide you with the nutrition you need. So when you say grains, just to be sort of specific, um, are we talk we're talking mostly wheat? I mean, sort of rice is fine, presumably... Yeah, rice is uh, fine. Quinoa is fine. Oats, a lot of the other, ru, ru, like, yeah, so oats, like oat milk and things like that. Oats are variable, but again, you know, you're getting into a grey area there where you've got to say, look, we're all individual. We right. all react in different ways. Try things. If things make you feel bad, then have a good think. If they don't make you feel bad, you're probably fine, and you can carry on with them. Because if, especially with OMS, if you're, if you're not, if, you know, if you're missing dairy, so you have something like oat milk and you decide to get that out of your life, you're going to eat, you, you know, you can just make the, make the, make the diet too difficult. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be careful at this point, not to say, right, no, no bread, 
um, no wheat, no rye, no oats. You, 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 because each time you get rid of one of those, you're getting rid of potentially very highly nutritious foods. So then you've got to look at the rest of your diet very, very carefully. So if you're eating a, a truly gluten-free diet and you're also having processed food, you can end up in trouble. So is it useful maybe keep a, a food diary and experimenting and trying, you know, is, is this okay if I'm like you sort of switching to spelt or I'm, I'm still using having oat, but I'm not, I've got rid of the packet bread. Yeah. And, and try do, and one see. Thing, do one thing at a time. If you're going to make a change, then make that change. Don't make a load of changes together because then you'll be confused as to which aspects of the changes is actually to make, making the difference. You know, if you, if, if, you, if you don't want to see the doctor, if your symptoms aren't that bad, then completely removing gluten from your diet is quite doable. In oat milk, rye, barley, beer, as you said earlier on, and all wheat products is, is doable for a month or six weeks. And if you feel a lot better, then um, it raises the issue of whether it was gluten or not, because there's a big placebo effect. Uh, you know, att attached to actually positively doing something. So reintroduce it. And if all those other horrible symptoms come back, then you know that you've probably got a, an issue with gluten that you need to deal with. And again, it may be dose related. You know, you, uh, you know that it is amazing how much wheat we can eat. And if it, it may just be something you need to take care of. So from what you've been saying, one of the things is... Um, this sort of over and it, this has come up with a lot of other people's so actually the over processing of food I mean do we have to accept that we need to spend more time cooking because I think the modern diet essentially we, we in the last 30 40 years we have got to a point where we get home we put something in the microwave or the oven and we 20 minutes half an hour later eat a meal and we're not really willing to accept anything beyond 20 minutes or half an hour to cook a meal. Mm -hmm. And also, the other thing you mentioned was the price. We accept, ex expect food to be really cheap now. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly in the UK, and I think probably a lot of the world, partly due to the situation in Ukraine and other things, prices are going up and people are saying, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm, but it's like, hang on, we were... You could go in a supermarket and you could buy a chicken for like two pounds. Mm. And as you're saying, like a loaf of bread for 60p and things like this, the, the prices were, and, and there's a lot of competition in that market. So the price was being driven incredibly low. So is it a point of we need to accept that we need to pay a bit more for food and we need to accept that we need to spend a bit longer making our meals? <laughs> I think so. One of the big changes, I mean, the situation has been transformed in my lifetime. I remember, uh, I think I was about 15 when the first supermarket in North London was opened. Prior to that, my mum would do this rounds every day, going to the, to the fruiterer, the veg shop. They were separate in those days, the butcher, the baker, and all the other shops she needed to get the food she needed. And she'd get them every day. Um, and my father worked, my mother looked after the home that was that that was that that was the format that we've got that, that pertained for god knows how long over the period of our lifetimes everything's changed women are usually are often working now and as you say you get a home at the end of the day you don't want to spend an hour and a half in the kitchen uh, preparing meals in the way we used to so fast food convenience food is uh it is something that has crept into our lives and now is dominates 60 percent of the calories we eat come from ultra processed food which is even worse than you know really cooked meals and so on but i'd i'd say two things one is we yes we do need to pay more for food in a way because farmers farmers are struggling in this country the average income for a farmer is, is le less than twenty five thousand. the average age of farmers in this country is 64 so we need to reward farmers properly for what they do which is give us <laughs> urban dwellers the chance to live uh, we absolutely rely on farms here and around the world and we need to make sure they get a better deal and of course you know a, a, a high quality loaf of bread costs three pound fifty a low quality loaf loaf costs 50p um for for you know 50 percent of the people in this country worry about their their finances on a day-by-day -day basis which to me is one of the markers of poverty if you spend every day anxious, worried about, you know, where the next um, shopping bill's going to, how the next shopping bill's going to hit you, then you're, you're always scrimping, always saving and buying a pretty 
low quality diets. And when it comes to MS, neurologists I speak to are increasingly saying that it's becoming a disease of poverty. Uh, they're seeing more and more people come to the clinics who are overweight, eating a poor diet, and uh, you know are, are struggling financially. These are wider issues than OMS uh, can address in a way, but the reality of the world we're facing is an intrinsically unhealthy one. Um, at some level, this has to be addressed. For those of us who have a choice, I'd say, yes, we need to spend more on our food. We need to buy quality. Um, there are ways, of course, for busy couples to do this, to have one cook a week where you cook, you know, a, something that can last you a week. We have freezers now, which is very good. Um, and also maybe try and create a format where cooking becomes something pleasurable, which is an art that is gradually being lost for many households in the country. The, the, these are tough times. These are tough times. Money is tight, time's tight, people are stressed, and there's an absolute flood of some of the worst food that humanity has ever eaten, cheaply and readily available in, in supermarkets, which you can usually get to within a minute or two of your front door. Okay, on that note, so well, finally, do you have any final thoughts or recommendations for um, people thinking about gluten and their mess? Yeah, I would say define your relationship with gluten um, by taking a number of steps. One, make sure you've not got a serious problem by seeing your doctor if your symptoms are severe. If you're worried about intolerance, maybe consider getting it out of your diet entirely for six weeks and then restarting it to see it. And if the symptoms recur, you know where you are. Um, but for 90% of us, we'll be absolutely fine with gluten uh, as long as it comes with high quality food because the low quality food that you buy white bread highly processed um bread uh bread and bread products biscuits buns cakes and confectionery is pretty damaging to um all our health everybody suffers from that who eats poor quality food and then you can know where you are rather like the ms program once you define where you are find your new way in life you can just carry on with it and not have to worry about gluten anymore whether you're enjoying it because it doesn't because it does you good or whether you've left it out of your life because you know it upsets those hundreds of trillions of organisms in our microbiome which depend on what we eat to give us the health we've co-evolved with them with that thank you so much for being our guest on living well with ms Colin. um the insights on gluten and ms have been incredibly useful i think um and i think everyone will find it a useful perspective to have a look at and I encourage everyone to learn more about this, this topic and have a look at the show notes. We've got links to Dr. Bannon's um, pages um, and more information. So thank you again. And we hope you tune in next time for another new episode of Living Well with MS. And also the sister podcasts, Ask Jack for catering related stuff and Living Well with MS Coffee Break. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast. You'll find all sorts of useful links and bonus information there. Do you have questions about this episode or ideas about future ones? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. We'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Living Well with MS is kindly supported by a grant from the Happy Charitable Trust. If you'd like to support the Overcoming MS charity and help keep our podcast advertising free, you can donate online at overcomingms.org slash donate. To learn more about Overcoming MS and its array of free content and programs, including webinars, recipes, exercise guides, OMS circles, our global network of community support groups, and more, please visit our website at overcomingms.org. While you're there, don't forget to register for our monthly e-newsletter so you can stay informed about the podcasts and other news and updates from Overcoming MS. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time. The Living Well with MS family of podcasts is for private, non-commercial use and exists to educate and inspire our community of listeners. We do not offer medical advice. For medical advice, please contact your doctor or other licensed healthcare professional. Our guests are carefully selected.
but all opinions they express are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Overcoming MS charity, its affiliates or staff.